Swift provides us with three primary collection types known as arrays, sets, and dictionaries for storing collections of values. We are often required to loop through these collections and perform some kind of action or modification on each. Similarly, we often like to loop through a range of numbers and sometimes by skipping by two or some other number using stride. Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and in this video we're going to look at a variety of ways to loop through collections and consider the elegance and pros and cons of each. Before I get started, let me request that if you enjoy the video, please leave a comment below and give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Make sure you ring the bell to be notified of new videos, and if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. If this is something you want to learn, then keep watching. I've created a starter project for this video, and I encourage you to download it from the link in the description below, and work along with me. Once completed, you'll have a nice set of playgrounds for future reference. There are four pages in the playground workbook, one for working with arrays, one for dictionaries, and one for looping through ranges. I've not included sets in this video, but the techniques you learn here can be applied to sets as well. And we'll also take a look at the break and continue statements along with nested loops, along with the while and repeat while constructs. As always with my playgrounds, I use a shared function that uses a completion handler to keep my code and printouts for each section quite separate. So let's get started. A common way to loop over an array of objects like this array of countries is to use a for in loop. You start with the keyword for and use a singular version of the noun that you use to define your array. So in my case, for country in countries, and then within the code block, I can print that country. Now since arrays are an ordered collection, the order in which the items in the array are created is fixed and predictable. So when I loop and print, I get my countries printed in that same order. Though I've created this playground using Xcode 12 and running iOS 14. As a quick aside, I want to show you how code completion in Xcode 13 has come a long way. I have a beta version of Xcode 13 here, so let me show you that same playground in that version. Now remember when I just created that for in loop in the Xcode 12 version? I had to type out my code word for word. In Xcode 13, if your array is a recognized plural word, as soon as you start typing, it will present you with an auto-completion that not only generates the singular term, but also completes the closure for you. This is going to be a real time saver. But since it's still in beta, at this time I created the video, I'm going to stay with a released version of Xcode 12 and type it all in. As an alternative for a for in loop, you can use for each. And this is not to be mistaken with the Swift UI for each that has a capital letter F. The lowercase for each is a method on a collection that calls the provided closure on each element in the sequence in the same order as a for in loop. So in our case, we start with the array and then apply the for each method to it. Autocomplete now kicks in, and because the for each method has a trailing closure, we can just hit enter on the keyboard to get the trailing closure syntax. And this provides us with a placeholder, which is a single element in the collection. So as before, we can call it country, and the body of our closure becomes the same as that we had in the for in loop. Now I've covered this many times in my videos on higher order functions in Swift. And in fact, I've covered the for each method specifically in one of those videos. And it's possible to shorten your code by using shorthand arguments to represent the elements. This allows you to remove the element argument and the in keyword and replace it just with dollar $0. zero. I'll leave a link to those videos in the description below. So in our case, we can rewrite our code like this. Again, running the playground shows an identical output for all three versions. Now, sometimes you need to know which item or index of the array that you're working with. And in this case, you can use a for in loop that starts at zero which is the first index, and then iterate through until you reach the number of items in the array minus one, because it's zero-based indexing. And we can name that iterator index 
and go from 0 up to, but not including the count, so we use an open range. Then in our code block, we can not only print the index, but we can also print that specific indexed item of the array. As an alternative to this, we can specify two arguments for our for in loop, one for index and one for an element in the array, and then apply the enumerated method to our array. The body then can use both of these arguments in our print statement. So what would the same thing look like if we wanted to use the for each method? Well, as before, we start with countries, then apply the enumerated method to it, which returns a sequence of pairs that we can then use the for each method on. And because they're an enumerated sequence of pairs, we can provide a variable name for them. The first one represents the index, and the second a single element of our collection, which we'll call country. And the closure body is the same. Now to complete this section, we can use that same shorthand argument version as before, but this time, since we have two arguments, we can use $0 to represent the index and $1 to represent the country. Often you will see developers remove all line breaks to display the code in all one line. And it can be argued that the longer version is much more readable, and you'll find that many coders prefer not to use shorthand arguments for that reason. However, you're going to come across these shorthand arguments all the time, so you had better get used to them, particularly when developers like to remove all blank spaces and line breaks to shorten the code into a single line. Dictionaries are another collection type that are unordered collections of key value associations. And by this I mean that each element of a dictionary collection consists of two parts. The first part is called the key, and the associated second part is the value. So dictionaries have no index, so in order to retrieve the value of a dictionary, you specify the key. So let's take a look at the same approach that we took with arrays. To use a for in loop, we'll need to specify an iterator that represents the key and one for the value. And you'll often see those words used, key and value. However, you should always use variable names that represent what you are presenting. And in our case, the key is a country and the value is a flag. So for country flag in country's dict, we can print each out. Now what you'll notice about dictionaries is that when you run this code and inspect the printout, the order is not the same as it was in the dictionary. In our case, instead of printing Canada first and then the United States, it starts with Canada, but then is followed by Sweden. Dictionaries are unordered and you cannot rely on the position of the elements in a dictionary. It's entirely likely that you'll have a completely different set of results. Well, we can use the for each method on a dictionary as well. We just need to specify two different variable names in the closure, one for the key and one for the value. Now, what's really important to note is that there is no single element. So don't think that you can use two different shorthand arguments here as well. You can't. Now, if you want to use a shorthand argument, you have to use a single dollar zero. But then in the printout, you specify that you want the key and the value individually. Now, I mentioned that dictionaries aren't indexed, so why would I use enumerated at all? Well, you can use it to be able to specify the element keys and values in a for in loop without specifying two arguments for the closure body. You might not see this very often, but for completion's sake, you can do this with a single argument and specify the dictionary is enumerated. Then to access the keys and values, you can access the iterator's element followed by the key or the value. Now, if you want to omit the element keyword in that print body, you can provide a placeholder of the useless index like this, and then omit the element keyword. 
Now, I'm not sure why you'd want to use these last two versions, but I thought that I'd offer them for completeness sake. Now, the for each versions of these would be ones where we start the same way as we did with the array and specify a single argument representing the country, and then in the, the body is the same as it was before. Now, as above, if you want, you can remove country altogether and replace it with the shorthand argument $0. Similarly, to omit the element, we can use an underscore to represent the index in our closure. So how would you use shorthand arguments in this case? Well, this time there are two arguments, not just a single element. There are two separate entities. The first one is the index, which we don't use, and the second one is our element. So to access the country, we'll need to use $1. Now, one other thing, I'm not sure that you noticed this, but this time when I executed my playground, the order has changed. Canada is now followed by Denmark and not Sweden. So it's really important to remember that you cannot rely on a dictionary's order of elements. A range is a half-open interval from a lower bound up to, but not including an upper bound. For example, this is a range from 0 up to, but not including 10. And we can see if we option click on the variable name, we see that it is a range. Now, if we close the range, but use three periods instead, we can define what is known as a closed range, and this includes the upper bound. Now, whenever you use a range or a closed range, you can loop over the elements just as you do for collections. So we can use a for in loop by providing a variable for our iterator, and then provide the range. If the range is already defined as a variable, then we can use that variable too, just like this. Similarly, we can start with the range, or open range, and use for each. We can also use that shorthand notation and use either the range itself or the variable representation of that range. If you'd like to loop through a range of numbers but in reversed order, we can use the reverse method on it. And this also works on arrays as well. If you want to do this using shorthand notation and for each, we first have to apply the reverse method to the closed range and then run the for each method. Now, if you want to loop over a sequence of numbers skipping some, like for example, every two, you can provide instances of a stride struct. And there are two versions. The first one is like looping over a closed range like this, using the from to initializer. So striding from zero to 10 by two. And then if we use a for each loop on this to loop through them using a shorthand argument, we see that it doesn't include the closing value. It's just like a range. So how do we get that final value in the sequence? Well, instead of using the word to in our stride, we use through instead. To finish off this video, let's take a look at some important keywords that you can use in your loops. First, it's important to note that this 0 through 100 is not an array. If we option click, we see it's a closed range. 
If we want to turn this into an array of numbers, we can do it like this. Now we see it's an array of integers. Using the for each method is distinct from a for in loop in two important ways. First of all, you can't use a break or continue statement to exit the current call of the body closure or skip subsequent calls. Also, using the break return statement in the body of the closure will exit only from the current call to the body, not from any outer scope, and won't skip subsequent calls. So let me show you how this is applied. Let's take a look at this example. What we want to do is print out only even numbers in our array of numbers that are less than 10. And there are a variety of ways to do this. Let's create a loop that prints out all of our numbers from 1 to 100. This will print them all. Now I'm going to introduce two key words. Using the guard statement, I'm going to do a check on number that will only proceed if the number is less than 10. Else, I can use the break keyword to break out of the loop. Now, if it passes this restriction, I want to do another check and only proceed to print out the number if it's a multiple of 2. And for this, we can use the swift remainder operator, the percent, and only proceed if the remainder when divided by 2 is 0. So we can use another guard check here. However, if the remainder is not equal to 0, we don't want to exit the loop entirely, so we don't want to use break. We just want to jump back to the top and get the next value without proceeding. So for this, we'll use continue. And then finally, if we manage to get past this point, we can print out the number. Running this now, we see that we get just even numbers less than 10, but not including 10. Now, for each doesn't have these key words, so we would have to take a look at an alternative way to do this. And this is where filter comes in. I have a video on this topic, so I'll leave a link in the notes below. But for completeness sake then, how can we write this code using filter? Well, first we'll filter to restrict the array of numbers to numbers that are less than 10, and we'll use shorthand notation. And then on this set of numbers, we'll run another filter that's filtered to accept only those with a remainder of 0 when divided by 2. And now with that filtered, filtered array, we can then on this array use a for each and print out the number. It's not particularly readable, but it is elegant. Now let's take a look at nested loops. And this is a loop within a loop. For example, let's print out a pair of numbers that can represent a row number and a column number in a table that has five rows and three columns. For example, that would be 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, all the way up to 5, 1, 5, 2, and 5, 3, which would represent the last row. So we can do this by nesting loops. So for row in 1 through 5, through a closed range, and then within that, for column in 1 through 3. And then we'll print out the row and the column. Now the question is, how could we skip the second row entirely? How would you do this? Well, one way is to use a guard statement in our row loop. And if the row is not equal to 2, we can continue, which means that it will not proceed to the next step, which will print out the columns for the row, but rather get the next row itself. So it jumps back to the top. As an alternative to this, we could put our check inside the column loop. This time, however, instead of continuing, which would only go to the next column, we use a break to break out of this loop, which will then take us back to the next iteration of the row. It doesn't break out of both. It only breaks out of the inner one.
To complete this video, I want to mention two other formats for looping over collections or ranges. And that's to use the while keyword or the repeat while keywords. I have to admit that I seldom use these formats, but it's worth seeing what the difference is. And the key difference is that if you use while, depending on your check, the loop may never run. For example, consider this. We'll start with a counter that starts at 1. And we want to print out all integers for 1 through 10. Using a while loop, it looks like this. While the counter is less than or equal to 10, we'll print the counter and then increment. So it will continue to run through this loop until the counter is equal to 10. If our counter started at 11, however, this loop will never run because that first comparison is not true. On the other hand, a repeat while loop does the check after the first iteration, so it will always run at least once. And we format a repeat loop by using a counter first to set it at 1, but then we start repeat where we do our printing of the counter where we increment the counter, but then our while statement comes afterwards. So it doesn't matter what we start our counter at, it will always run at least once. So you choose what format for looping through collections makes the most sense for you. Often the situation will dictate that for you, where you may need to break out or continue in which case you can't use the condensed for each format.